An amazing letter from Leo III lays out in black and white how Al-Hajjaj worked to collect the various parts of the Quran in the 8th century, long after the standard Islamic narrative claim by Muslims that the Quran was created during the time of Uthman. With me here to unpack all of this for us is Dr. J. Smith. Dr. J., who is Leo III, if you want to tell our audience, and why is his letter important? Well, we're going to talk about Leo III, but let's just say why is it that we're even talking or bringing him into this. So far, every testimony we have for Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali is non-existent. There's no eyewitness account. There's nothing at all for these four caliphs. Schumacher says this. Everybody has been saying this. You can't find any reference to these four caliphs in a city called Medina, because that's where their headquarters is, but going to Mecca for all of their uh, for all of their sanctuary and all their puja, as we call it in, in, in Hindi. None of that exists. Nothing in the seventh century. And yet everything that Muslims, everything that every all, all you are watching, all the Muslims who are watching this program or anybody who has studied Islam is dependent on is that there has to be these four caliphs who two of them created the two recensions of the Quran, Abu Bakr the first and Uthman the second. Abu Bakr 632, Uthman 652, 20 years apart. So everything we know about these two recensions just doesn't exist in the seventh century. It's nothing more than hearsay coming from the ninth and 10th century redacted back to the seventh century. So Shoemaker is saying enough, enough, enough. We've got to, we've got to follow where the evidence lies. You and I have been saying this. This is one thing we've always looked at. Mm -hmm. So we need to go to the eighth century because there's nothing in the seventh century there. Well, we do know, I'm so, before I say there's nothing in the seventh century, we do know about Mu'awiyah. He comes, he, there's lots of references to him. Uh, he is the first caliph from 661 to 680. For 20 years, he's caliph in Damascus. Why isn't he way down in Mecca, Medina, if, he, if he's part of the caliphal, pro, caliphal uh, contingent? He comes right after Ali. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he has nothing to do with Mecca, Medina. You're going to see why as we get into future episodes with Shoemaker. Shoemaker shuts down the Hijaz. Damascus is where he is. For 20 years, he's a Christian caliph. The Marwan that's come to power, and that Marwan the first, and then he dies, and Abdul Malik comes, his son comes to power, 685, uh, uh, from 685 to 689, for 20 years he's in power, up until 705. And then uh, you, of course, then you have start to get testimonies and witness. We have lots of material on Mu'awiyah, we have lots of material on Abdul Malik, we have coins, we have manuscripts, we have buildings, we have kiblas, all this fits the historical, the historical record of both Mu'awiyah and Abdul Malik. Well, that's why we need to go and see who else is talking. We've already talked about John of Damascus. Let's look at Leo III. Now, Shoemaker talks about Leo III, and he's talking, and he's referring to the Armenian Chronicle of Levond or Levond from 789. So now we're talking about the late 8th century, you have this Leo III. And he has a series of letters that go back between him and this Umar II. So we're talking about the late, this is an Abbasid, an Abbasid uh, a, 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 a authority. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating is those letters do exist and we can look at them. Now, I'm just going to read you what Shoemaker says. In fact, look and see what uh, what Leo, I'm sorry, not what Leo, uh, Shoemaker says, what Leo III says. Right. This is one of his letters. Let's just read it. He says this, but you are yourself, he's talking to Umar the Sec, you are yourself want to make such falsifications, especially in the case of a certain Al-Hajjaj. So he's referring to Al-Hajjaj, the governor under Abdul Malik, who was anointed or appointed governor of Persia. So that's in what is today Baghdad. We're talking about uh, Stesfan. Uh, well, it will soon become Baghdad. Who was appointed governor of Persia by you, who gathered all your ancient books and wrote another according to his taste and distributed it throughout all your lands. For such a thing was quite easy to accomplish with a single people, with a single language, as it was in fact done, excepting only a few works of Abu Tarab, Abu Turab, sorry, in other words, Ali. For Al Hajjaj was not able to destroy them completely. So there it is in black and white. Here's another witness from the 8th century who is saying this all happened with Al Hajjaj. He was the one that destroyed the others mm -hmm. and kept his book, but he didn't, wasn't able to destroy all of them. So that's 
that's the reference that Shoemaker is pointing to. Now, what are Shoemaker's conclusions concerning that? Well, here's his conclusions. We have here then a contemporary report from outside the Islamic tradition, in this case, Leo III, that confirms what the Islamic sources relate concerning Al-Hajjaz's production of a new standard Quran to replace the various regional versions and their divergent memories of Muhammad's revelations. Leo III's account Composes do, composed during the first part of the 8th century and most likely sometime before 730, closely matches the description of those of these sources of Al-Hajjaj, gathering together the regional codices that had emerged independently in the main centers of Islam and harmonizing their differences into a new official standard version, which presumably was more or less identical with the Quran that has come down to us today. Leo III's letter, however, says nothing about any sort of prior collection of the Quran by earlier figures from Islamic history, Uthman or otherwise. So here is a good a good a reference point that Shoemaker is saying. We've got to look and see what the people are saying. And they're referring specifically to Al-Hajjaj, that this was his work, that this was basically his responsibility. It did happen. It did exist. He's talking in the 8th century, so he's close to the event. He's also there on the ground. He does not have a bone to pick, and he's certainly not part of the Abbasid tradition that would have, that would have er er eradicated this known uh, fact. So that's why you can see we can trust him because of the fact that he is even disputing this. With and also, Omar, I like the fact that there's a focus on Al-Hajjaj here, uh, uh, simply because not only uh, he played a role in, for instance, let's call it, uh, editing the Quran, okay, let's call it that much. But you remember the Qibla of Al-Hajjaj or during Al-Hajjaj was in the middle between uh, uh, basically Petra and Mecca. And remember during that time there was a transition in power and there were conflicts and it's quite possible that that's the reason why the Qibla was facing in that direction, kind of like he was trying to be politically correct and balanced between the two. So uh, there is a lot uh, here that now when you put it all together, starting to make more and more and more sense. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. I hadn't even thought of that. Well brought. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, what are we going to talk about next? Well, we're going to move to a third testimony, uh, possibly an eyewitness, but certainly a testimony from the same century. And this is a guy named Abraham of Tiberius. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, dear brother. Thank you, everyone. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.